Welcome everybody to um, Dr. Ellie White's uh, exit exam. Exam, oh, it implies that it's graded. Exit presentation, uh, right. exit presentation. The exams are all done for her. If there are any more exams for her, she'll be on the other side of the desk. Um, <laughs> Ellie finished a, a very interesting and I thought thoughtful uh, dissertation on applications of machine learning to uh, the estimation of unimpaired flows or natural flows, depending upon what you're looking for. Um, and, and this dissertation is up on my website if you want to go see the book version of it. Um, and she's here today to give us a um, overview of that, summary of that uh, dissertation. She's going to uh, leave us, sadly. Um, and and go on to, to uh, postdoc with the uh, US EPA in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, but I, I thought many of you would be quite interested in her work because it has, I think, some implications for um, for a lot of our work here in California. Uh, I'm going to request that everybody put their microphones on mute uh, so that um, when your phone goes off, we don't all get to hear about it. Uh, and so that we can all better focus on the, the sage uh, information that uh, Dr. White is going to impart on this. So without further ado, oh, I should also note that uh, we are recording this for posterity uh, and to help make Dr. White famous. So without further ado, please turn off your microphones on mute and uh, we'll hear from Dr. White. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah, I um, accepted a position at EPA, but I'm hoping to come back. So maybe this will be still useful. I'm, you know, I've gotten familiar with California hydrology. So we will see. Um, let's start with the presentation. Every, can, can you all see my, um, my presentation? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so today we're going to talk about statistical learning for unimpaired flow prediction in ungauged basins. This was my uh, PhD, and some of you may have seen some version of this uh, for the qualifying exam. Um, so this might be a little familiar. So first, we're going to look at the statistical knowledge map that I developed for a literature review. We're going to talk about some statistical learning methods. Uh, not these ones, they're in my dissertation, but uh, if you all want to talk to me about all of this, uh, this uh, we can do that at the end. But I really want to show you the neural networks that I built. We're going to talk about data transformations um, as the data gets processed to go into the model and uh, loss functions for optimization, resampling for test set error approximation, and we're going to try to break the model with climate change data and see where we fall short. So the chapters of the dissertation basically follow the decisions that have to be made in statistical learning. So all the way from the data to the results and benchmarking. So we're going to just follow um, the decisions that need to be made. First, let's get on the same page in terms of the words that I use. When I talk about machine learning, I'm talking about the algorithms and the implementation of the theory and mathematics that have been developed in the field of statistical learning. So statistical learning is a broader term in my mind than machine learning. I'm not going to be talking about artificial intelligence. Sometimes these things get grouped together, but artificial intelligence is really trying to model human intelligence. And with neural networks, we're somewhat doing that because we're trying to mimic the brain, but this isn't what we're talking about here. This is, uh, we're talking about predictive modeling and machine learning. When I talk about loss function, uh, what I mean is the objective function that we minimize. And so in our, in our research group, meet, group, we usually use the word objective function. Uh, in statistical learning, they use the word loss function. So I'm just going to go with the term loss. Um, I'm going to be talking about autocorrelation and these are dependencies and correlation that exists within a data set itself. And we're going to describe uh, what we mean by temporal, spatial, and hierarchical autocorrelation. 
And then lastly, I'm going to be using this acronym PUB, predicting ungaged basins. Um, it's become a very familiar term because the International Association of Hydrological Sciences dubbed predicting ungaged basin as a grand challenge for the 2003 to 2012 decade. So um, it's, a, it's a grand challenge in hydrology. So what do we, what do we mean about predicting ungaged basins? Let's say we have gauges on a river network. We have, base, we have basins here. And at locations one, two, three, and four, we have data. There are locations on the network where we don't have data, but we are interested in knowing flows in these locations. So predicting ungaged basins is basically an extrapolation of information in space. You can say extrapolation or interpolation however you want to look at it, we're uh, basically taking the data that at locations we know and finding data for locations we don't know. And this can be useful um, for managing watersheds that aren't gauged, or it, maybe you're modeling something else and you need flows at these locations. Now, when I say flows, I mean unimpaired flows. And, um, as we got into it with Tarek a little earlier, these aren't natural flows. Those two terms are different. Unimpaired flows is the flow that is produced by a basin without human created uh, water storage, diversions, or return flows. So if we just take the humans out of the watershed, how much flow will we have? So basically you take the flow that's coming out of a gauge and you take out all of the water that you've imported and you bring back in all the water that you've diverted or water that is lost to the system through evaporation, you add that back in and you account for change in storage. So that's just what that formula means. And that's the response variable or that's the variable of interest, unimpaired flows. We're trying to predict those values. We have these values calculated at 67 basins in California, mostly Sierra Nevada, some coastal and some Southern California basins. And they come from the California Data Exchange Center. And the rest of the data set, so we have unimpaired flow, we talked about that. The rest of the data set is basin and cli climate and basin characteristic data. So things like drainage area, precipitation, soil, and all the rest. And it, I've described how I've uh, processed this data in the appendix to my dissertation. Um, so here I'm showing correlation with unimpaired flow. First, let's look at the literature review that I uh, did. I made a statistics knowledge, lab, uh, knowledge map. Um, and I know that that's small. So I wanna show you on this screen. I hope everyone can see it. If not, please speak up. Um, so uh, let's say you're uh, at, the, at the top, the, the top goal is data analysis. Obviously, you have data. What do you do with it? Well, there's two things you can do. You can either uh, use it for prediction, or you may want to use it for inference, just, uh, just to learn about the data, or maybe you want accurate predictions somewhere. So if your goal is predictions, there's, there's uh, a few things you can do. You can either do a general modeling, uh, maybe the time component of the data is important, so you wanna do time-dependent modeling, or maybe the space component is important, so you do space-dependent uh, modeling. So as we go down through the flowchart, there's certain questions that you answer yes or no to, and at the end, it recommends a certain um, modeling technique or statistics technique. And we are basically at this end of the graph. We're, on, we're doing supervised machine learning because um, we're trying to predict unimpaired flows. And uh, my main motivation in doing this is because I was learning about all of these different methods but didn't know how to organize it in my head. So this became a useful tool in organizing it. Um, I've grouped these methods into supervised machine learning. The regression family, if you need an equation, becomes useful. Time series analysis, if you want to focus on the time component of the data. 
geostatistical methods if you want to focus on the space uh, dependency of your data. And as we go over here, we're going more into inference. And with inference, inferential methods, you can uh, have descriptive methods, uh, measures of centrality and dispersion, uh, things that we're very familiar with, and some things that we're not quite as familiar with because some of the, some of this uh, these methods are meant to deal with text, for example. They're not meant for us necessarily in hydrology. And we have some like clustering methods in here as well. So that was a, a big overview of my um, literature review. And as Jay puts it, organizing the chaos. Now back to the presentation. Okay. So let's talk about some of the statistical learning methods that I've used. Um, we are basically in this part of the graph with total a priori ignorance of the system. So by that, I mean, we, there's no physics involved in modeling with statistical learning methods. It's purely stochastic. But in hydrology, uh, there's been a tendency to move more and more towards total a priori knowledge of the system. And so the models have become more complex. But we don't know if um, modeling, uh, if the predictive capability of the model gets better as it becomes more complex. And now that we have all of this computing power, there's more um, justification for using statistical learning methods. And we can see how well we do here. But traditionally, uh, hydrologists are known to make causal or mechanistic models with physics. So some of the statistical learning models that I used in my dissertation were linear models, generalized linear and random forests. And if anyone wants to stick around and talk to me about all of these uh, at the end, we can do that. But in the inter interest of time, I'm not going to be really focusing on these. What I'd like to focus on is the neural networks. Um, and we'll see in the results why I like them so much. But first, what are the components of a neural network? A lot of you might have seen these graphs. So um, neural networks typically have an input layer, an output layer, and a hidden layer. This is a very typical neural network architecture, and it's all fully connected. And I'll explain what that means later. So this is called a dense network. And what happens in these nodes is the data that comes through gets transformed. And that's what I'm showing over here on this side on the right. So let's take, for example, one row of my observations. Uh, so one month of unimpaired flows. I have a precipitation value, drainage area, snow, land use, land cover, all these other predictive variables in here. So th these are my predictive variables. And each one of these variables has a value it's associated with it. It goes through the first node. So when it goes through a node, it gets multiplied by a certain set of weights, the weights, uh, and then those values get summed in the propagation function. We can also have a plus B here. So a bias term can be also added here if we want. And then um, the results of this uh, go through a thresholding function. So that's called an activation function. Depending on whether or not uh, this value meets the threshold or falls short, that uh, the overall prediction can be increased or decreased. So at the end of this, we have outputs. So as you, as you might think, we had one row of observation here going in, and neural networks get, can give you multiple predictions for one observation. So that in and of itself uh, gives you a nice way of doing sensitivity analysis. So at the end, we now have a prediction. We had an observation before. So the distance between this prediction and observation can be your loss. So basically, you want them to match, but they're going to be off. So how, how far off we are is the loss. And this distance uh, needs to be differentiated so that we can find the weights. So in this optimization problem, we have the loss function, the decision variables are the weights. And so we need to find the weights that exist inside all of these different nodes. And so 
since the derivative of this loss depends on the sum uh, that comes through these nodes, and this sum depends on the weights, then we have a simple chain rule in calculus, and they call it backpropagation, but that's basically all it is. It's the chain rule in, in calculus to find um, the uh, derivative of the weights. And so with that, with mi minimizing the loss and finding the weights, you have basically set up an optimization problem. Now, now that we've picked what kind of modeling method we want to use, uh, the main question is, how do we transform our data? So what is an observational unit in hydrology? One common way of viewing this is to think of all the land that contributes flow to a certain gauge is considered um, the basin. So for example, one gauge one is this basin up here, but then gauge four is the whole thing. And that's a very common view of hydrology. I have called this the aggregate method. So you're, you're using the an aggregate of all the land that contributes to flow, flow at gauge four. Another way of viewing this is to think of gauge four as a gauge that transforms data from the gauges above it. So here, gauge three and gauge two get transformed um, through this land, incremental piece of land here, and then we have gauge four data. So that's in, in this case, the, the basins aren't overlapping. So you have smaller basins here. And this way, you have a way of preserving the network information in the modeling. So four is now connected to the values of two and three, whereas here it's not. So there, that's the two ways we can view hydrology. And this is a common way because the values that you observe at each of these gauge locations are the values you use. There's no pre-processing needed here. But here you have to subtract the values that you see at four, uh, subtract uh, the values of three and two from four um, to then use the incremental basin modeling approach. And then of course, at the end, when you've modeled it, you add them back in. Um, so those are the two methods, but is, is, is doing all of this processing worth it? Well, we'll see. The, here are the results of the first round of modeling that I did. We have observed values on the X axis and predicted values on the Y axis. The aggregate methods are here and the incremental methods are here. And then you have each row is the modeling method. So linear models, generalized linear, random forest and neural networks. The goal is to have your observations equal your predictions. So the goal is for the data to fall along this dotted line, the one-to-one -one line. That would make for a perfect model if, data, if the data fell along this line. This black line is the line of best fit. So it shows that sometimes you have the systematic underpredicting of your values. And with the R squared here in this plot, you can figure out how well your model is doing. So the closer to one the R squared is, the better the model is doing. And that's why I like normal networks, because look, it's just almost on the line. It's great. So um, another thing that I forgot to mention is hierarchies. And um, with that, I just mean how far down the network are you? So if you're in a hierarchy one, you have no gauge information above you. But if you're in hierarchy two, you have one gauge above you in the, in the network. So that's what the col colors mean. So for example, uh, this green is hierarchy of four. So that means you have three gauges above you that can supply information in the incremental modeling approach. So um, one, one bad thing about the R squared is that it doesn't uh, um, account for the bias. So it doesn't account for the systematic underpredicting or overpredicting that we see um, in, in this graph. How we do that is if we've just multiplied the R squared by the slope of this line, you get the bias corrective coefficient of determination. 
And that's what I'm, uh, I've used throughout the dissertation, and that's what I like to show here. It's, um, it's easy to understand. So the closer to one, again, that you are, the better your model is doing. And as we can see, the neural networks do uh, very well. And these, these ca categorical classifications of unsatisfactory, satisfactory, they come from the EPA. Um, Moriasi had a paper on what um, is a very good hydrologic model on a monthly time step. Now, hydrologists also like to look at the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency factor. They're very similar. These two uh, errors are very similar. And um, as you can see, again, the neural network does very well in the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency factor. If we look at the results spatially, uh, things become interesting because what we would like to see is for this plot to be random, for errors to be occurring randomly. But as you can see, they're not. There's, a, there's this ridge right al along the center of California where my model does much better than it does at the headwaters. And so we have to remedy that um, somehow. And I, uh, the uh, biggest thing that contributes to this phenomenon is that, well, these gauges are exhibiting larger flows. So if I'm um, training with a certain loss function, then these basins will have priority than uh, these basins do. So the headwater, you're, you're predicting these basins better at the expense of the headwaters. Now, if we go back to uh, looking at each of the gauges separately and uh, analyzing between the aggregate and the incremental method, we can see that as we go down in the hierarchy, so as we go down the network and the hierarchies get larger, so um, a hierarchy of five means that you've got four gauges above you that supply information, we see that the incremental modeling approach just becomes way better than the aggregate method. So there's real value in doing a little bit of pre-processing beforehand um, to make sure that we're making use of all the information that exists inside our data set. And of course, um, a, a hierarchy of one means there's no gauge above you and aggregate and incremental doesn't really matter what you do there. Now to benchmark my model, I uh, compared it to the basin characterization model. This is a model developed by uh, some researchers, uh, USGS researchers, um, the Flints, who I met, um, wonderful people. So there's 10 uh, basins where our models overlap. So that's what I'm showing here, the national efficiency factor for those 10 models. Uh, my model does incredibly bad for the Makalne, and that's because I had one year of data, whereas in every other basin, I had 33 years of data. So if we just uh, excuse that basin for now, because there was so little, so few data points there, and just zoom in onto that graph, we can see that how the neural network increment, incremental or aggregate method, whatever method you use, does um, very well in like eight out of the 10 basins. So there's real value in using these, these modeling methods. Now, to peep into the black box that can be a neural network, we can look at the variable importance plots. And this, graph shows that which, um, which predictor variables became important in the modeling. So what is it that the neural network is using to um, predict unimpaired flows? So where does the information content lie, basically? And uh, as expected, drainage area precipitation and some uh, elevation and snow and some uh, climate variables become incredibly important. But then after that, especially for the neural network, the one in blue, these, these blue circles, the other information after that, there's not a whole lot of information content in there for the neural network. So the neural network can learn from very few parameters. Um, but whereas if you have a simpler modeling techniques like a linear model or a generalized linear model, you see they make uh, use of a whole lot more variables. So if your data set is wide, 
then you can use these other methods and get away with it. But if you have a, a data set where you don't have a whole lot of predictor variables, a neural network can make use of that information a whole lot better. So takeaways from this chapter. Incremental Bayesian modeling provides an easy way to include network information in statistical learning mo models, and we should be making use of that as much as we can. And the neural network can learn from uh, can learn a whole lot from very few parameters. So that's why I like them, and that's why I singled them out for this presentation. The next thing we have to decide for modeling is uh, what should be our loss function. So first, some terms. Loss is the distance between observed and predicted values. This distance can be defined as an absolute error or as a squared error. Risk is the expectation or the aggregation of the loss over all the points. So for example, the mean squared error. But um, very confusingly, sometimes risk is also called loss. Um, Regret, on the other hand, is the difference between the consequences of a suboptimal decision and an optimal decision. And since this model isn't being used to make decisions, and it's very hard to quantify regret, we're not going to do, uh, we're not going to use regret at all. We're going to use the risk minimization framework, and that's what that says here in math. So some typical loss functions that exist in statistical learning are the L2 norm and the L1 norm, which I showed before, the squared error and the absolute value error. And then another one is the linear exponential error. And I like this one because it's not symmetric. These are all symmetric and this one isn't. So depending on the phi value that you use for this equation, you can have different looking loss functions. And this comes in handy here, because when we're designing a loss function for the predicting ungauged basin problem, I argue that it should always be asymmetric losses. Why? Well, here we go. So we have uh, our observations, let's say, is in the black over here. Now, we, if we're, let's say on this side of the graph, we're in a flood event. And on this side of the graph, the graph we're in a drought. I would prefer to over predict a flood and under predict a drought rather than the less desirable opposite, right? Because if I under predict a flood, then I'm not prepared for it. Um, I'd like to be prepared for a more severe flood and a more severe drought. So the different directions of loss have to have different costs. So this direction of loss should have a low cost, this one a high cost, and vice versa on this side. And how we do that is with the asymmetric loss functions that I showed. So linear exponential could be one where you have high cost on one side, low cost on the other side. Or um, in statistical learning methods, we can now uh, handle non-differentiability at, at the origin point. So this function doesn't really have to be smooth, we can use a simple line. So high cost and low cost. And you define that with the hinge function. I'm not sure Kathy's here or not, but Kathy, if you're here, um, this was what we were talking about last week, right? With the, um, uh, with the hinge function that you had for um, flood, flood insurance, the two views on flood insurance. So that's how we can uh, define different alpha and beta for different sides of the graph. Or we can make use of the squared error function and have a weighted squared error. So you're just squaring the error here. And to look at the results, I'm just showing the American River at North Fork. This is a USGS gauge. I'm just using this as an example, but you can, you can click through them in, my, in the PDF of the dissertation online. Um, and look at all the basins, but here's one. And if we look at the weighted least squares error that is in dark orange and the linear exponential error, which is in pink, these are the two asymmetric functions. We can see that we are systematically overshooting the floods uh, in both the pink and the orange and not at the expense of the low flows. So here we're undershooting the droughts 
at this end of the graph as well. And I know these are going to be negative predictions that physically don't exist, but we'll talk about how we can fix that later. So this graph really shows us that the problem that I've seen a lot of papers talk about in hydrology, which is we're trying to get the floods right, but we get them at the expense of the lower flows. Well, that's because of the loss function, the symmetric loss function that you're using. If you just switch to an asymmetric one, that problem goes away completely. So if we look at the density or the frequency of the occurrences of unimpaired flow, we can see that again with the linear exponential and the weighted least squares error, we have, we're predicting way more floods than uh, there exists in the observations. And these other methods, mean squared error, mean absolute error, and log cosine hyperbolic error, these, um, I've oh, and this one, mean squared percentage error, I've explained these in the uh, dissertation. So if you uh, would like to take a look and discuss, we can do that too. But just very quickly, I'm going to say mean squared percentage error, very bad for data that is um, skewed positive. So never, this is good for relative errors, but never use it when you have data uh, like, like we do that is skewed positively. So the main takeaway of this chapter was we can use asymmetric loss functions to represent the desire to be conservative. So we want to we want to make conserv conservative decisions. So we want a uh, prediction of a flood that is more severe than it's going to be, or a prediction of a drought that is more severe. And uh, to fix the problem of fitting the peaks at the expense of the lower flows, we never have to complain about this problem again. We just have to fix the loss function. So now we have the model and um, we have the data sorted out and loss functions picked the model has been built, how do we know how well we've done with our model? Well, we need a test set. And one way of, uh, you either have a test set or you don't. And if you don't have a test set, which in our case we didn't, this was a theoretical problem we we're trying to solve, um, we have to come up with a test set. So we come up with test sets in statistical learning by resampling. Resampling methods do that. So my argument for this chapter was that if you have to make your own test set, you have to make sure that you resample like your sample. So if you have data that's dependent in time, space, and unique structure, you have to use blocking resampling methods. And if there's nothing you take away from this uh, talk, just take away this one. Don't use random fivefold cross-validation. <laughs> and you can quote me on that. <laughs> Um, so what do I mean by dependencies? Again, we have the gauges on our network. We, first of all, these gauges exist in, in space, right? So gauges that are closer together should exhibit similar behavior than gauges that are farther apart. So gauges in California are going to be more like one another than one gauge in California, one in Kentucky. So there's a spatial component here, but also, there's a hierarchical component because we've got a network. So there's a hierarchical component to the data too. Two gauges may be close to one another, but because they fall on two sides of a watershed divide, then um, the hydrology that, that um, feeds into those gauges can be very different. And then lastly, we have temporal autocorrelation, which means if I know the flow in my river this month, I have a better chance of predicting it for next month because we have this time dependency as well. So because these dependencies exist, uh, we have a problem uh, with um, coming up with our test set because our test set, uh, the, the resample has to exhibit the same behaviors as the sample. So again, we have these observations that are autocorrelated. If we do random resampling, like a random five-fold cross-validation, um, there are some observations that end up in the bag and some observations that end up out of the bag. This is basically training data and this is testing data. And because my model has already seen this data, it's going to have a very easy time predicting uh, this data that's out of bag. 
However, with blocked resampling techniques, these observations move in and out of the bag together. So now here, the model is going to have a harder time predicting, and we are going to get a more accurate estimate of our model error this way. So some resampling methods that exist uh, in statistical learning are cross-validation and the bootstrap. Um, I'll very briefly go over these, but um, in the end, I want to recommend that we start using bootstrapping and start using cross-validation a lot less, especially if we're doing model error estimation. Cross-validation is also used for nuisance parameter estimation in uh, statistical learning, which that's fine. But uh, if, we're, uh, if we're trying to find our model error, we should be using bootstrapping more. So what, what is cross-validation and bootstrapping? In cross-validation, you have your whole data set. You uh, divide your data set up into multiple folds. One fold become, becomes the test set. The others are the training set. And because you want each observation to end up in the test set once, you have to do this multiple times. So you can have five-fold cross-validation, five cross which means you have to duplicate your data set five times. So each, each time uh, one of these folds gets a chance to be at the, in the test set. In bootstrapping, you're resampling out of the bag with substitution. So anything that you, you sample out becomes your test set. There's multiple ways of doing cross-validation and bootstrapping. One is resubstitution, where basically anything that you use for training becomes your test set. A very bad idea because the model is seeing everything um, and you won't get a good estimate of your model error. Randomized is randomly assigning folds to your data. Leave one group out uh, is leaving one whole basin's data out when you're doing your um, test and train split. Leave multiple groups out is uh, assigning folds to the basins themselves, so the 67 basins. So, so for one, leave one group out, I should say that um, you have, since we have 67 basins, that means we have 67 neural networks built, right? Because each time your training set is becoming different. So um, there was a lot of computation that has to go, uh, that has to happen in these methods. Bootstrapping is the same way. We have resubstitution, randomized or IID. Um, some, some people like to call it IID. So in the independently, identical and independently distributed is what that stands for. But that's basically saying we're doing a randomized um, grabbing of the samples out of the bag. Blocked by group, again, is you, you're blocking one whole basin and you're sampling the basins instead of the individual observations of a basin. Blocked by multiple groups is you're sampling multiple um, basins at once. And so very quickly in the research design, the thing that changes is the cross-validation splitting technique or the bootstrapping of the samples gets changed here and then all the way through, you can have a bootstrap statistic distribution or a model measure of fit at the end. So to look at the results, um, let's just look at the random forest right now, but um, it's uh, generally true. Um, when you use the resubstitution method, you can get a 0.94 BR squared or when you use random tenfold, fivefold, or twofold, you can get some very good estimates uh, on your model, and that can make you feel very confident in your model. But if you're doing this for a predicting engaged basin problem, your block has to be at minimum one whole basin. So the leave one group out is at minimum what your block size should be, and we have estimates ranging from 0.51 to 0.61. So this is, this is a satisfactory model. If we look at bootstrapping results, it's the same way. IID was the randomized method, blocked by group and blocked by multiple group. And if you look at the neural network, um, you, you can get overconfident with a randomized method, whereas 
the model results are really somewhere between 0.83 and 0.88 for the problem that we're trying to solve at, at this point. And um, these results, I'm not going through all of these results here in cross-validation because they're not stable results. That's why um, I use bootstrapping and I'm more confident in these results than I am with cross-validation. So the main takeaways of this chapter is design your resampling strategy based on the true test set. If you don't have a true test set, then uh, the problem statement, if it's predicting ungauged basins, then one ungauged basin has to be your minimum block size. So your resampling strategy really depends on the question that you're trying to answer. Random resampling underestimates model error and problems where the data is structured. Our data is always structured because we're in, uh, we're in nature. Nature is going to give you structured data. And then lastly, we need to, as a field, get away from cross-validation for model error estimation and use bootstrapping for model error estimation because it gives more stable answers and it gives you confidence in well, Efron and Tip Shirani talk about this very uh, quickly in um, their, the, the Bible that they wrote for statistical learning. Uh, and Robert Hymans and I have gone back on this. So um, if you disagree with me, you're in Robert's camp. Um, but I believe that we should be using bootstrapping more and more for model error estimation. Now to break the model, what does this model do if we give it climate change data? Usually with statistical learning methods, we don't want to extrapolate outside of the range that is um, acceptable, we should say, because there's no physics involved in here. So we can't really trust a model that doesn't honor the physics. So let's see how our model does with climate change data in the year 2100, for example. First, which global climate models should we use? Well, David Pierce says these four out of the 32 that exist do well in modeling uh, California's historical climate. So I went with CAN ESM, an average model. CNRM CM5 is, is a cool wet model. HADGEM is a warm dry. And MIROC5 is a model most unlike the other three. So we have these four models. And we have two representative concentration pathways, one a medium scenario and one a high scenario. Basically, RCP 4.5 says, what if we get our act together a little bit in terms of climate change? RCP 8.5 says, business as usual, we're not doing anything to probe emissions. So uh, with these two uh, scenarios and these four models, we have four sets of data. This is the relative percent difference calculated for precipitation for each of the models, RCP 4.5 and 8.5 on all of them. And we can see that there's quite a range for California. Some, in some models, Southern California becomes wetter. This is probably because the climate is shifting, uh, the, the colder climate is shifting down. In temperature, they all pretty much agree. We're, getting, we're going to get hotter. Um, uh, for California, and it's especially worrisome for the Sierra Nevada mountains because we have snow back there. So the timing of our runoff is going to be very different. And then if you look at the runoff rasters, these are, this is runoff, this is precipitation fed through the VIC model, the variable infiltration capacity model, which is a mechanistic model built for, uh, to take rainfall and turn it into runoff. And if we look at the runoff rasters, we can see a wide range of possibilities for California. Um, Maroc 5 is, it, I mean, it, there, there's a reason they said this is unlike all the other models because yes, it's very much unlike all the other models. So this is, this is good. This is a wide range of uh, future scenarios for California. So how are we doing this um, analysis? We're putting the global climate model temperatures and precipitation uh, into the statistical model, the neural network model that I built, and looking at the unimpaired flows, and then comparing it to the precipitation and temperature that they put through VIC 
and they did a, a, a local downscaling on. Um, and this was done by David Pierce. And so um, you get the runoff rasters out of this. And then I aggregated those rasters to my basin boundaries. So now we have unimpaired flow and runoff that we can uh, compare with one another. Uh, I'm using runoff for this set of models, uh, this string of models, but it's, it, it is unimpaired flow. I'm just using these, these different terminologies to make it easier for me to refer to this set as runoff and to refer to this set as unimpaired flow. So if we look at the results, we can see, oops, we can see that if we uh, have the runoff on this axis, on the x-axis and unimpaired flow on the y-axis, they pretty much agree, except there's this funneling shape and at the low flows, we're not agreeing so much with, with one another. So if I plot uh, the mean California unimpaired flow, um, the unimpaired flows in blue and the runoff from, from the other models in black, they pretty much agree, except this is monthly flow. If I aggregate it to yearly with a one year moving average, you can see that the neural network just has a tendency to over predict and then a 10 year moving average just makes it even clearer that we're over predicting. So there's way more flow uh, in the system for um, neural networks than there is for the VIC and LOCA and aggregation uh, method. If we put, plot these values on the X and Y axis, again, we see that funneling uh, thing happen and with the one year moving average and the 10 year moving average, it becomes even clearer that there's a bias, especially at the low, low flows uh, that we're over predicting with the neural network. So the main takeaway of this chapter is the neural network model seems to have a bias to go towards over predicting low flows, which will have to be remedied if we were to use this model for future projections. And uh, the reason well, possibly is because I use the mean squared error for of training this model. Maybe, we, again, we need to go to asymmetric loss functions. But model improvement strategies. First, if we're going to be using this model for climate change, we have to do learning in a non-stationary environment. Climate change is a non-stationary environment. There's methods that have been developed that deal with this. One is covariate shift adaptation, where we weight the importance of the observations that we have already in the training of the model based on the probability that that observation will get queried later for the climate change um, results. So um, because we did the um, weighting scheme in um, the loss function chapter, this should be very easy because you just assign weights to each of the observations. And since you already know how to change your loss function, then um, that should be, that, that this should be straightforward. Another thing was, remember with the negative flows in, in um, the loss function chapter again, we, don't, we need to eliminate physically impossible flows. And we can do that with constraint optimization. Um, by constraining it, we have a lower bound of zero and an upper bound of precipitation times drainage area. We can really limit the uh, amount of water that's in the system to a physically possible value. And you can do that very easily in neural networks. Another reason why I like neural networks, you can add, add a constraining layer into the neural network where if, it's, if the prediction is outside of these bounds, then uh, the transformation function just brings it within the, within the bounds. Or we can use data augmentation techniques. So if we add data from a simulation model that already has the physics model in it, and we add that data to the uh, machine learning method, then the machine learning method may, may be more mindful of all of these um, constraints because it's seeing more data that follows that constraint. Another method is a regularization method where we just change the loss function. So we add a large penalty 
when the predictions are outside of this, these bounds. And that, those are next steps that I'm excited to do. Hopefully I'll have time to, to do that. And lastly, I just wanna acknowledge members of the committee, um, wonderful, wonderful advice um, from, from everyone, Robert, Jay, John, um, made this dissertation way better than it could have ever been. The Data Science Initiative, of course, at UC Davis, um, Duncan Temple Lang, he developed R, he was one of the original developers of R and made me a better programmer. The Institute uh, for Computational and Mathematical Engineering workshop at Stanford University. Basically each chapter of my dissertation came out of one of these workshops. So it was a great experience at Stanford and then uh, the Climate Change Water and Society program would not have, be, have been here or been able to be at UC Davis without um, the financial support that came out of this program. So that's it. Thank you very much. And if anyone has questions or wants, wants to stick around and, and talk more, I'm sorry, I, there's like seven minutes left, um, but I can definitely hang around and and talk as much as people want. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. White. If, if there's just a few questions, we can we can try to handle this uh, sure. in an anarchic fashion, just people asking them. Or if there's too many, we'll have you start entering them in the chat okay. and read off from them. So let's start off with any any question. Trying to get the chat back. You you either thoroughly confused or thoroughly enlightened everyone. Hi, I, Hi. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, I actually have a lot of questions after learning your um it's an awesome uh, presentation, by the way. Um, so yeah, like I guess my first question is um the prediction you made is time series type of prediction, but you use neural networks. I wonder how that's being like possible? That's a great question. I just assumed that the time, there's no information in time here that the neural network needs to preserve. But there are um, recurrent neural networks and long term, uh, long term short memory networks or something like that LSTMs, they do really well um, for this type of problem, that would be a good next step as well. I actually talk about that in the model improvement section that there's, um, I did an autocorrelation test on um, all of the basins and except for maybe a handful, maybe 10 basins, there was significant autocorrelation in time. So um, that would be very useful and it might even improve the predictions um, even more. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, uh, the time component was the next step. Oh, that's cool. So it means that the neural network doesn't know which months it's predicting. No. Well, but it has a really good results though. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, here's the thing, the, the month is a, a variable in the model, oh. yes. But it doesn't make use of the fact that the months are connected. So with recurrent neural networks, you do make use of that fact that this, mm. this chunk of data, they're, they're sequential, right? So the fact that they're sequential um, right now, it, that's information again, that I'm just tossing out. But it did really well uh, without the sequential data. So I just stopped. I was like, I have a PhD now. <laughs> the, the point nine, you know, the point nine two br squared was one. So with that, I was I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you add the uh, recurrent neural network, it would be a lot even better. Yeah. Than, you know, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And they they're so fast in learning, especially with LSTMs, because there, there's not a whole lot of memory requirements. I think that would be a really good next step. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I see that Kathy was here. So Kathy, you heard my shout out. Um, if you need to talk about that hinge function again, we can we can do that. 
Definitely. Thank you. I'm going to uh, reach out to you and uh, sure. thank you. that was really helpful for me to understand some of the things I've been reading, uh, but right. haven't quite under quite got yet. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Cause as soon as you told me that there was this, like there's two views and we're trying to combine it in one loss function. I thought, okay, this is again, this is like asymmetric loss functions. This is very familiar. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Joe asks, do you find that neural networks perform XG boost, cat boost, etc.? Yes, but I, I, with the cat, well, no, I should say no, because I didn't make a X, XG boost or cat boost. I, I just made random a random forest model. Um, I believe these are, if I'm not mistaken, these are tree learning methods that you're asking. For. They're non-parametric methods. The non-parametric methods do extremely well. But again, neural networks just blew everyone out of the water. And my theory is that um, neural networks are learning from very few data, right? So from the elevation and the climate data, and they don't need anything else. So it's learning. Um, and if you look at the neural network field, what's happening is the neural networks are getting wider. So there's more hidden layers rather than, no one's, no one's arguing for more data with neural networks, right? They're arguing for more computation. So the mo models are getting, so that's why we have deep learning now. The models are getting wider um, with random, forests or tree learning methods, I don't see them improving anymore. Like computation cannot help there, unless there's something in the field that I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, the uh, after the generalized linear models, the non-parametric methods are great. Um, uh, can you elaborate on the neural network architecture layers and neurons? Yes, let me pull this back up and share my screen again. So, let's see. Where is the slide? Okay. So here, um, this was the architecture of the neural network, right? So we have the input layer where all your observations go into, they get transformed, they go through a hidden layer, they get transformed again, and then at the very end you have predictions. So what's happening with the transformations is very simple. It's just getting multiplied by a weight, getting added together, Plus, uh, there might be a bias term here. And then this propagation, the output of this propagation function goes through a activation function. And in this function, it says if it's over a certain threshold, increase the value. If it's under a certain threshold, decrease the value. And um, then at the very end, you have the prediction. So. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, actually, um, Ellie, my question was um, yeah. I, more in terms of how many hidden layers and the number of neurons in oh, each that one. <laughs> Did you have just one hidden layer? One hidden layer and a fully connected dense network. And yeah. then how many neurons in that hidden layer? I can't, I don't remember, maybe 20, okay. 25 maybe. Okay. You have to look at the dissertation for that. Okay. Um, I saw that it wasn't sensitive to that. The modeling was not sensitive mm. to it. Yeah. Um, I just learned that a fully connected dense network is the typical, and I just started off, started off with the typical. Um, yeah, I mean, you can you can you can use one hidden layer with an infinite number of neurons, and you'll get yeah. really good. But you may overfit it. When I was getting at, if you get into the deep learning where you have multiple hidden layers, you may mm -hmm. even get even better performance. And especially yeah. tying it in with uh, what was discussed earlier yeah. about um, LSTMs or 
yeah. recurrent neuron or even convolution neural network, by the way. Yeah. Um, that's, yes, that's correct. But just to push back on the overfitting, I, I was, uh, I had my own test set, right? I, I had a blocked test set method for, um, throughout all the chapters, I used the, um, the leave one group out method. So I had a blocked uh, I blocked off one basin. So all the results that you're seeing are results in the test set. Um, and if it can, you know, if it was, if it was overfitting, it wasn't overfitting by much because the test set was 0.92 R squared. It was still pretty good. Um, so yes, but overfitting is something that we do have to, um, be mindful of. Another thing is, I don't think people understand, I, I, I don't understand, I don't think the neural network community understands how to pick the number of hidden layers, what they mean. <laughs> right? it, it, it's an art, it's not, there is no, you know, you've got exactly. certain, there are certain <laughs> guidelines, but again, you start with the simplest single yes. hidden layer and then you just add to it. You can have hyperparameters that you can tune and yeah. you can you can automate it to actually search how many hidden layers and how many nodes per hidden layer too. Exactly. Yes. And um, some people are trying to understand it. So the, like they, they say neural networks learn from abstraction. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if it's computer vision, then um, if it's trying to detect a face, it's going to try to in the first layer, it's going to try to detect the edges first. And then it's going to detect like certain features, right? If it has eyes, then it's probably, you know, a human or an animal. So there's like, th these layers do have a purpose, but with hydrology, it's hard to, it's hard to translate, you know, the layers into what it's learning, because to me, it's correlation. To me, it's like, if I have a bigger drainage area, I have more water, I have more water in my uh, river. So I don't see another level of abstraction past that. So maybe it's just like past human understanding at this point. Um, but yes, yeah, very, very, it's very interesting like how we make decisions about all these things. Um, yeah, we, you have to kind of understand what's going on to be able to make intelligent decisions here. And by the way, I, I really like the uh, summary of the, all the t statistical techniques that you showed earlier. Uh -huh. uh, do you have that in one big PDF so I can plot it out and put it on my office door? Do you mean the one where I showed like uh, from total a priori knowledge to total uh, like the hy hydrological method? No, I'll go way back to the beginning. You had the oh, kind of the cascading different techniques. Yes, yes. I, I, I that's funny you should say that because I tweeted that and <laughs> it, it, yeah, people like that. Um, this one, right? No, no, oh. go back, go back. Very, very first slide. There we go. Oh, this, oh, this, sure. Yes, I have a link, it's on my GitHub. Um, I'll I'll share the link with you and then um, do what you will with it if you want to uh, change it or or um, make it your own? Yes, please. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost as long as the Calvin schematic that I have. Yes. <laughs> I insisted funny. it would not be bigger than that. Okay. <laughs> Let me Thank put you. it in the chat. Maybe I can. Yeah, and this is this was, you know, it, it was useful to me, but. It was useful to me, but um, uh, so th it contains methods that I understand and are useful to me, but for everyone, it's going to be a little different. Um, and if you see any mistakes, please let me know. Um, yeah, this was, uh, th I took this to Jay and Jay was like, write a paragraph on each of these methods and you've got a literature review. <laughs> That's uh, how this works. Wyatt has a, has a question in the chat. 
Oh, um, for some reason, I have to stop sharing for the chat to come back. Uh, let's take it. Um, okay, quiet. Yes. Do you see potential for gaining a better understanding of the physical hydrologic relationship through NNN or AI methods in general? Uh, this is such a hard question to answer. Um, the hydrologist in me wants to say no. <laughs> um, right, because we don't, we, we understand physics with experiments and, you know, um, the only thing I really got out of the neural network was the variable importance plot and the partial dependence plots, which you can see in the dissertation. This, these are ways to kind of open up the black box and be able to look inside a neural network. I wanted to look at the weights on uh, each of the layers to maybe make sense of uh, what's going on inside the model. Uh, there are methods and, and people in the neural network community do do this. Uh, I just don't know how informative this is. It may, like the variable importance plot, all it showed me was that neural networks learn really quickly. <laughs> so it gave me understanding of neural networks, not necessarily hydrology. I already knew that drainage area and precipitation were going to be, become important, right? Um, I'm not including variables in the model that I don't think are important for hydrology. In fact, we shouldn't be doing that because of something called the Stein paradox. Uh, and if you can look look that up on Wikipedia, but basically, if I if I added the number of coffee uh, cups that I drink a day in my model, I might make the model perform better. But they're, 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 you're not; it's not related to hydrology, right? So when we do use statistical learning methods, we have to come at the modeling method with an understanding from hydrology. So if I don't know if it works the other way around, right? So I don't know if the neural networks can really teach us much about hydrology. I wish, I, I, I hope that they do. I hope that someday they do. Um, I like these methods. I'd like to have a job doing these sorts of things. Um, but, um, but yeah, we come, we come to the statistical learning method as scientists that already know the variables that are important. I especially don't like models that have hundreds of variables, right? Um, it, it, making sense of that isn't, um, isn't easy. And, as, and of course, science paradox says, don't do that. You might improve your model, but then uh, you're, you're not modeling the same thing. Um, I hope that answers the question, but we can have a discussion about this too. People can unmute themselves for sure if they want to. Um, so, I see a question. In the incremental basin approach, are you subtracting observed flows among gauges? If so, how does flow routing play into this? Yes, I am. That's uh, so basically. My, my basins are non-overlapping in the incremental approach and I'm subtracting gauges above, modeling the incremental part and then adding in the gauge data above it again so that when I'm comparing aggregate and incremental flows um, in the observed versus predictive plot, for example, I'm, I'm comparing the same values, um, same magnitude of values, I should say. Um, yeah, so the routing, that's how the routing plays into this. Basically, in my data set, I, I said, here's the gauge. Um, what's the first gauge above it? What's the second gauge above it? And so my data set contains that network information. And then uh, it iteratively went through and, and subtracted out the gauges that exist above. Um, Thank you so much for the compliments, you all. Um, are there any 
differences in predictions for snow dominated versus rainfall dominated watersheds? Um, I did, I didn't quite, well, I didn't explicitly say this, but with the maps that I produced um, in the, bio, the, the map of California that I produced, it, it shows um, that the, uh, the watersheds that are snow fed that have higher values uh, are, are modeled better. So, because we had some coastal and we had some Southern California ones, but then the ridge along um, the middle of California, that was where the model did well. And the snow variable became important, in the variable importance plot. And I'm particularly proud of that because I didn't have snow data. I had to come up with my own snow um, data and it was just uh, prism precipitations under two degrees C cumulative and it gets zeroed out of every, um, every summer. And uh, I see Marielle's in here. Marielle helped me do that years ago. I don't know if you remember, um, but yeah, that's how we, we calculated snow. Uh, the reason why I didn't use other snow data was because the data sets that existed didn't overlap with my data set. So I would have had to truncate uh, my data set pretty, like, uh, pretty wildly. So I decided against that and came up with the, my own snow. And then it became important in the variable importance plot. So um, yes, uh, I think in some degree, in some degrees, especially possibly in the random forest, we have to look into this, but um, I think to some degree, the machine learning methods are doing their own classification, right? So they're, they're, they're doing their own, um, this is snow dominated versus this is rainfall dominated. Um, but we have, to, we have to look at that. Are there any differences in predictions? Oh, no, uh, we answered that. One minor comment is that for prediction at ungauged basins, one might be also interested in the expected predictive uncertainty. Yes, that's what I was talking about with the resampling. I'm not sure if, um, for talking about the same thing. If not, uh, Jingfu, please chime in. Where can we read your dissertation? It's on Jay's website. Um, oh, and Gracie put it in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, and let's see. And that's it. Yeah, Jingfu, if I'm not answering your question. Uh, yeah, jump, jump in. I'd like to. Oh, with an error bar. Yes. I mean, with neural networks, you can do that very easily. I didn't do that. But yes, um, we can have an error bar when the model outputs a certain prediction. Yes, that's very good. Um, and with neural networks, it's very easy to do that. But I uh, set the dimensions to where it just gives me one prediction. Basically, the neural network can give you multiple predictions for each observation, and you average them at the end to be, basically say, this is my prediction. Uh, with And then you have a confidence interval, right? Because you have multiple predictions. Yes, that's a good, good comment. Can you share your slides too? Um, I'll put it on GitHub because I don't know, Erfan, um, where to find you. If you can message me or email me, I can also share it. So, here's my email if you are interested in the slides. Yes, please please email me because I wouldn't know how to find you all. Uh, but also it's, it, it, I have a predicting engaged basins repository in GitHub and there's a presentation folder. 
everything everything will be uploaded there. So if you want, you can go to GitHub. Yes. Anything else? People are dropping off. We're looking more and more like our research group. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I tried to bring, I, I can't believe how I went so much over in terms of time, I'm sorry. I did a practice run, it was like 45 minutes and then today's practice run was 30 minutes. But then when I got to talking, I think I went a full 45. <laughs> I, I think it was a perfect length. There was time for questions okay, good. And, and then we ran over for additional questions, which is fine. Okay, good. You have the rest of your career to do the rest of the questions, so I'm not too worried, Dr. <laughs> Thank you very much.